Above the fireplace in my living room, I have a small photograph of my grandmother who passed away more than 20 years ago. She was a woman of great faith and a great influence on me in the ways of the faith. And every time I look at that photograph, I remember her and I remember the faith she lived and died in. In that photograph, you will also see me. It was taken at a cousin's wedding, and it was taken at a time when I was far from being a man of faith, much less being a priest. And so, when I look at that photo, I am reminded that much of my faith I owe to her witness, and I cannot quantify how much of my return to the faith was as a result of her prayers for me. Many people have on the walls of their homes photographs of loved ones whose witness of faith, courage and love have shaped them into the person they are today. That photograph on the wall reminds them of much more than just the person depicted. It reminds them of the bonds the Lord forges in the lives of his people which death cannot break, which persists long after our loved one has departed this life and which will be experienced once again in heaven but then with none of the shadows and imperfections which mark so much or so many of our bonds with friends and family members here below. And perhaps some of you have on your walls photographs or portraits of people in your family line long since departed, people you never met but whose lives and faith have helped shape your life and your faith today. They are on your wall or above your fireplace because they are part of your life story even if their life story came to an end long before yours began. This same sentiment of respect and reverence is what we Catholics give to members of our big Catholic family who have left the world stage, but whose lives and influence are still felt by the Church and the world today. And so we Catholics have in our homes, and we carry on our person, images of various saints, statues and pictures of great men and women of faith whose witness and whose life stories inspire us, encourage us, and have a ripple effect on our life and the life of our church to this day. Chief among those, of course, is Our Lady, Mary Most Holy. Who could doubt that her life and her faith-filled response to God are having an effect on each and every human being right now? For her, yes to God enabled the Word to take flesh. For having these images, we Catholics are at times accused of idolatry. We are said to worship statues, which would be a clear violation of God's law if it were true. But we do not worship statues. We merely use them to remind us of the great saints and all that the Lord Jesus' triumphant grace and power have done in them and through them. Would it be an insult to a painter if we gazed with admiration at his work of art? Would that artist think himself robbed of the glory due to him because we are captivated by the intricacies of his brush strokes? Neither is God so insecure in his glory, that he would think our admiration for his masterpieces of grace, the saints, is anything less than our admiration for the Lord himself, who has done great things in and for these men and women. But, it might be objected, we've been told in Scripture, in chapter 20 of Exodus, to make no graven images. That is true. But the meaning of that prohibition 
is clearly not to make images that will be treated as gods. God has forbidden us to make statues for worship, but he has not forbidden us to make use of statues at all. The images we fashion of the saints are not there to be worshipped as though they were many gods. They are there, much like our family photographs, to remind us of who they are, who we are, and how God has brought them to glory and wishes to bring us there also after a life of fidelity to him. That the book of Exodus prohibition on idols does not mean we can make no images whatsoever is clear from the fact that God in Exodus 25 mandates that two gold statues depicting winged cherubim, angels, should adorn the Ark of the Covenant. Furthermore, in the book of Numbers, in chapter 21, God directs that a bronze serpent be fashioned by Moses in order to heal the bite of the fiery serpents that were attacking the chosen people. Is God directing Moses to break the very commandments he gave him? Of course not. These images were made for ornamentation or religious and ritual purposes, but not to be worshipped. When a Catholic looks upon an image of our blessed Lord, our Lady, or one of the saints, is he or she doing anything more serious than the Israelites who were directed to look upon that bronze serpent? Were the Israelites worshipping the serpent? At a later stage in the life of God's chosen people, they did indeed begin to worship that bronze serpent. And one of the few good kings of Israel at the time, King Hezekiah, had the image then destroyed. And that's in uh, the second book of Kings, chapter 18. And when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies of the temple to worship before the Lord, was he committing idolatry because in the temple's holiest place, he was standing in front of two large statues of angels? Would those angels not rather remind him of the heavenly reality that he had just stepped into? For where are the actual cherubim stationed but in God's presence in heaven? Neither are we Catholics guilty of idolatry, for we use statues and images in the same way as anyone might use a portrait or photograph of a loved one. It recalls them and their lives to our minds and helps us to focus on how they responded to God's grace, inspiring us to do likewise. And when we pray before a religious image, we are not praying to the image, but rather through the use of the image, we are better and able to keep our hearts and minds focused on the particular prayer or the particular virtues or teachings that saint has possessed or given. As we look upon the usual depiction of Saint Therese, for example, we see her embrace the cross and with an arm full of roses. This reminds us that she was completely given over to Christ crucified and that she encouraged complete confidence in the goodness and mercy of God, a goodness and mercy which she was convinced would refuse her nothing for the good. And so she promised that once in heaven she would obtain from the Lord a shower of grace under the symbol of roses for those who seek to enter upon the gospel path that she called the little way. As her entry into eternity approached, from her deathbed she said, After my death I will let fall a shower of roses. I will spend my heaven doing good upon earth. I will raise up a mighty host of little saints. My mission is to make God loved. So when we look at a statue or a painting of St. Therese in that usual stance of the cross in the, her arm and, and her arm filled with roses, we're reminded of this great message and this great assurance from this great little saint. 
So do not be afraid to have lots of religious images, icons, statues in your home, or religious images, maybe medals on your person. When we look upon them, we're reminded, we're reminded of our union with our brothers and sisters, the saints now in heavenly glory. We're reminded of their constant intercession on our behalf, for which we rely so much on. And we're reminded that they are great saints and only great saints because of the wonderful, all-encompassing, infinite mercy, love, and grace of God.